Hi everyone and welcome to another video by BioTeach. I'm creating this video specifically for BTEC students but I think A-level students will also find this really useful as this topic is covered in A-level biology in the second year. BTEC students, this is relevant for Unit 9, Learning Aim B, which looks at homeostatic mechanisms and this would be what you would need to cover in your P task. Homeostasis actually refers to the constant physiological state um, of the body, despite any fluctuations in the external environment. So we call it the maintenance of a constant internal environment. Organisms are able to maintain a relatively constant physiological state despite any changes in their external environment and any change in the environment to which an organism responds to is normally called a stimulus. And because the environmental stimuli are not static, i.e. they're changing, Organisms also have to adjust their behavior and their physiology constantly to maintain that homeostatic state. And that actually requires the coordinated activity of the body's organ systems. And we're going to talk about that in a second. But the key thing here that I need you guys to understand is that, is that homeostatic mechanisms will actually prevent any deviations from a steady state um, and keep the body's internal conditions within quite strict limits. And this is because the deviations from those strict limits can be quite harmful to that organism. So the main thing to understand that in terms of the detection, we've got as part of our nervous system various receptors. So I've used the example of the eye as a receptor in this. The whole point of the receptor is to detect changes and send messages to the control center, which is usually part of our brain. The control center will receive the message and coordinate a response. And that response will basically communicate with the effector. And this effector could be a muscle or a gland. The idea is that the message is received by the effector and that creates an output. And that system keeps on going around and round and maintains that homeostatic balance that I've talked about. Homeostasis is responsible for maintaining things like constant body temperature. For example, when your body is in activity, it's gonna have increased heat generation. The whole point is that we don't want to increase the temperature too much because that's going to affect things like enzyme activity and the rate at which enzymes and substrates collide and create our metabolic rate and so on. Similarly, we have to also regulate blood glucose concentration and also levels of pH, which I've not mentioned on the slide, but I think that's an important one to be able to understand. And lastly, we also look at the control of the water potential of the blood, basically maintaining the correct water potential so that our cells don't shrink or swell and become damaged through that. In biology, a feedback mechanism is a physiological loop that brings the body either toward or away from the normal steady state. The feedback mechanism is also referred to a feedback loop, as I mentioned earlier, and it can either amplify a certain biological pathway or it can inhibit it. These pathways are most commonly uh, used to return the body into homeostasis. And there's actually two different types of feedback in homeostasis. You've got the negative feedback loop and you've got the positive feedback loop. So homeostasis relies on feedback mechanisms. Just to kind of explain what the feedback mechanism or the feedback loop is in a very simple way, let's take the example of your heating at home. Your thermostats will be set to a certain temperature, let's say that's 20 degrees as an example. When the temperature goes below 20 degrees, the heating system is triggered to go on and bring it back to that set point of 20. When the desired temperature is reached, the heating then goes off. So when we think about negative feedback, it's normally just a series of changes that result in a condition or a substance being restored to its normal level, what we call the set point. And it basically ensures that the body conditions remain within a certain tolerance range because that's the optimum at which that organism works at. Imagine the set point to be a bit like a seesaw. When the seesaw is balanced, we're in homeostasis, but various activities can lead our seesaw to go off balance like it's shown in this diagram. And if that happens, our receptors, our control centers and our effectors will create a response to bring about the balance again. We can also depict negative feedback in a graph type format. So on here, you can see on the y-axis, you've got this factor to be controlled. And on the x-axis, you've got the set point and time going across. So you can see there in the first instance where the disturbance has been caused. So let's just say, for example, this is when you wake up in the morning, this is the measure of your blood sugar level. 
A disturbance here would be you eating breakfast. Your blood sugar level would start to increase, hence the graph would go up. And that change or the blood sugar level would be detected by a receptor. And once that receptor has detected that change, it will bring about the negative feedback loop to ensure that your blood sugar level doesn't rise above a certain point. And so the effector will basically reverse that particular change. That's the negative feedback. And the next part of the graph where it kind of goes below the x-axis or the set point would be an example of, say, for example, you woke up and you skipped breakfast. This kind of new disturbance would essentially be, say, for example, your blood sugar lowering. And so that you can see then the blood sugar as it goes down, it then brings about the new corrective mechanism. Whatever mechanism that is in your body, we'll talk about in the merit. But essentially, the whole point is that it brings it back to the set point. The other type of feedback that we talked about is the positive feedback. And this is when a change stimulates a further change in the same direction. Positive feedback mechanisms essentially are amplifying a physiological response in order to achieve a particular result. It's useful when that stimulus actually needs to be amplified. So, for example, like an action potential is an example for positive feedback. But actually, it's not very useful when the increase in the response cannot be controlled. For example, hyper or hypothermia, when the body temperature changes and we can't control it. From the graph, you can see here that there's a disturbance that takes place and that basically will stimulate further changes and the graph continues to go up and up and up. So it's a bit like a domino effect. Another example of positive feedback is what happens during childbirth. There is the release of a hormone called oxytocin, which intensifies the contractions of the uterus so that labor can proceed to its conclusion. The birth itself will actually restore the system by removing the initiating stimulus, i.e. the baby coming out of the body. After birth, levels of things like milk production and the hormone prolactin will increase and the suckling of the baby on the mother's breast will cause the release of oxytocin and continue to stimulate milk release. So that's an example of positive feedback. When that baby stops suckling on the breast, the milk production will then decrease. Another example of positive feedback is fruit ripening. Ethylene is a gaseous plant hormone that's involved in fruit ripening and it accelerates the ripening of fruit in its vicinity so that nearby fruit also ripens, releasing more ethylene. Overexposure to ethylene will actually cause fruit to overripen and that's kind of what's shown in this feedback loop here. So I hope that was super useful for everyone. As mentioned before, this is part of the P2 task for Unit 9, but also for A-level students looking to revise what homeostasis is. For BTEC students, you will need to include the importance of homeostasis in your assignments. You will also have to include definitions of negative and positive feedback and some examples of it in brief and also how feedback mechanisms will maintain. You might wanna give these examples from this video that I've used. Thank you so much for watching. Feel free to leave me any questions in the comment section. I've also added some other useful videos to the description of this one, so make sure you check those out as well. Bye for now.